That's enough fellowship now, and um, you can be seated. Well, glad all of you are here. If you're new here, my name is Jeremy, and I'm an associate pastor here, and um, you're going to want to come back next week. You chose wrong. Uh, pastor Simeon's speaking next year, so come back. You can stay today. We'll let you do that, but come back next week. And if you're online, hey there. And uh, we're glad you're here. We're kicking off a new series today. It's really exciting. The series is In Christ. And there's so much richness in the Bible that talks about being in Christ. And so uh, we're just going to explore all of that. And today we're going to start with being created in Christ. And um, some of you know um, that this is my first time speaking since I, I had COVID. I got COVID really bad, was in the hospital, and the Lord healed me. And so, um, and I'm so thankful that he really did. The doctors and nurses did a great job, but the Lord really, really was present with me. And many of you prayed for me, and I just want to say thank you. Um, the Lord heard those prayers. Some of you didn't, and I'm disappointed in you. Um, but uh, no, I'm just teasing. I'm thankful to the Lord. But I went to the doctor this last week, and I'm, I'm getting back, but I am still... Um, out of breath. Now, I was out of breath before COVID, but I'm going to blame it on it. And my recall feels a little slower too, so be patient. This morning, maybe instead of preaching, um, we're going to just uh, look at, maybe do a Bible study. And so I'm going to talk that way, and we're going to start in Ephesians, the second chapter. If you have your Bible or you look on your phone, you can look at Ephesians, the second chapter. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 10 together. And you can just leave that open or just keep reading. Um, keep it your finger there in your Bible. And we'll go back to it a few times. But Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, it says, uh, <clears throat> And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen. Um, so we're um, starting this series, and so we're beginning with being created in Christ, created new in Christ, and uh, looking at what that means, because all the benefits that you'll hear, and there's so many of uh, being in Christ, be, start here. If you're created new in Christ, everything else comes. So what does it mean to be created in Christ? And in church, a lot of times we'll use words like uh, born again or you have new life, but they all mean that you've been created in Christ. And what we mean by that is our sins have been forgiven, the, our inside person has been, it's been changed, there's new life and it's being changed even, and we have a promise that for the rest of our lives, for all eternity, the Lord will, will create and do um, and make us exactly who we want to be, the best humans ever, and full of joy and happiness. And that all comes from being created in Christ. And so we, when we're looking today uh, how this happens, Paul tells us here in Ephesians, the second chapter, he tells us how this happens. And he says in verses one through three, he tells us that we are dead. And in verses four through seven, he, tell, he tells us how God makes us alive. And then finally, at the end there, in verses 8 and 10, he shows that if you have been made alive now, then you will be the kind of person who you want your, your whole life to give glory to the one that made you alive. So the first there, verses 1 through 3, we find out we are dead. Right away, when Paul opens up and we see this, we find out that we're not new creations at all, but far from it, the Bible shows that we are dead in trespasses and sin. And we're not children of God on our own. In fact, we're 
We're, we're far from God. Um, when, when, when we read this, it's kind of surprising because a lot of us think, well, we're, we're all children of God. Everyone's a child of God, but the Bible doesn't show that. The Bible shows that God is the creator of us all, but on our own, we are far from, we're far from God, and in our own nature, we rebel against him, and we chase after things that we want for ourselves. We seek our own desires and our own wants, and we have, in our own state, no peace with God on our own. And so here comes Paul telling us that instead of being children of God, we are, we just read that, you see in, in 2 and 3, that we're children, rather, of wrath. So we're not merely like little children in God's eyes that are mischievous, and he's kind of rolling his eyes and sighing about, but the Bible says that God actually sees us as we really are, rebellious sinners, far from him, worthy only of his judgment in our own state. Without him, scripture says we are lost and we are dead. Aren't you glad you came this morning? But that's why the gospel is so beautiful. And before we talk about the gospel, if you hear that type of thing and you start thinking, well, wait a second, like, like I, I know what you're saying like for some people, but I'm I'm a good person comparatively. I know some people that are really bad. I make mistakes. I try. You know, I've stumbled here and there. But overall, I'm a good person. If you feel your heart like kind of, kind of kick against the idea that no, you have to be born again. You're not enough on your own. Then look at look what Paul says. He says you were dead in trespasses and sin, and you walked in the wrong way. And you were by nature the wrong person. He says there's two damnations here, two nails in the coffin of who you are if Christ doesn't come. The first nail, he says in verse three, is he says you are by nature children of wrath and you follow after the wrong things. Two times he says you're following the wrong things and you're by nature the children of wrath. And what he's showing is that we have a broken nature we're, we're inside when we're, bro- when we're born, we're turned inward, we're selfish, we follow our own thing, we want our own way, it's who we are to our core. That's why the Bible says things like we're born and shaped in sin and iniquity and all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. We're all, without God, we're all broken in our very natures. In, in the Garden of Eden, we had... Um, we had a representative. The first man was our representative, Adam, in the Garden of Eden. And Adam in the Garden of Eden had a choice. God put trees all through the garden, but this one tree, he said, don't eat of that tree. And Adam, faced with the choice of obeying God or disobeying God, he disobeyed God and he sinned. And when Adam sinned, He represented us all. And the Bible says because he sinned, his guilt was counted to everybody that that comes after him. Every descendant is guilty of that sin. And because we come from broken Adam now, when we're born, we are born with that broken nature, that sinful nature. Look at what Paul says in Romans 5. Talking about Adam, he says, therefore just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. And in just a few verses later, in verse 19, he says, for as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so Adam represented us in the garden. Adam sinned, and so now we have his guilt and we're born with a broken nature far from God. It's who we are on the inside apart from God. That's the first nail. The second nail in the coffin, Paul says, it's not just that. In those first three verses, he says it's not just a passive fact that you're born with a broken nature and you're guilty of sin. A true judicial truth, but it's not just passive. He says you also sin with your own faculties and members. That it's who you are. You see in verse two, he says you walk in this way. You're choosing to do it. And then he says that you live in the passions of your flesh. We live out the passions of our flesh and we carry out the the lust, the wrong desires of our mind. So now he's saying, that we're walking in it and we're actually using the things that we have to carry out wrong passions and wrong desires. We choose this. 
And so we live life, and apart from God, we may do many good things, but those good things are often to be noticed or they're to earn our salvation. So even the good things that we do have an undercurrent of selfishness. We're trying to earn our own way. And the Lord knows we do bad things. We sin. And then specifically to, to push on this, Paul uses two words, passions and desires. He says that you have wrong passions and wrong desires, and there's trouble now in, our, in where we're at because our own voices are telling us our passions and desires are what we are. And now we're living in a culture that's telling everybody, your passion and your desire is your true self. And you need to look inside and what this society needs, they say. Thought influencers and people say what this society needs are authentic people. That stop pretending, so look inside. And whatever the darkest, deepest, weirdest, oddest thing is, you better grab that thing and make it your own because that's who you are. And if you're not living that true self that's on the inside, then you're wrong. But it doesn't take but a little bit of living for anybody to know that following your own desires is the way to the harshest prison you can live in. The darkest prison is one where we're ruled by the warden of the prison telling us that everything you think you are and you have to chase down every lust and every want and that's who you are and you can't escape that. But that's what's going on and that's where we live. That's where I've lived before where I'm, in, I'm, I'm captive to my own stuff. I'm captive to what my own self tells me I am. The own sins that I do, it tells me that that's what I am. And that's what Paul's saying. Do you see on our own how hopeless we are? Without, without a new creation, we are in this prison cell, locked up of our own passions and our own desires. And that means it takes it takes being created new, a new creation to be loosed from this stuff. It takes an act of God. It takes the Holy Spirit coming and being born again and born again out of the prison, born again out of those desires. Our desires are changed. Now, I can't preach. I had COVID. So you guys come up here and take this mic if I get going. It means, though, look, that religious talk doesn't do it. That if you know the right things to say and you grew up in a Christian house and you know the buzzwords, but you haven't been born again, it doesn't matter. There's no life there. It means that if you volunteer and you're part of the church and you're a leader, but the Holy Spirit hasn't come and there hasn't been new life born, then it's not true. You can look put together, you can act put together, you can tell everybody, you can try your hardest, but it takes an act of God Almighty to bring new creation and that's what we need. And without it, we're dead in trespasses and sin and walking according to the course of this world. So what happens, what do we do? Well, Paul says that what happens to a Christian is even though we're dead, while we're dead, in verses four through seven, but God, he says, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. That Christ comes and he makes us alive, but when he says this, he immediately says three things happen when you're made alive in Christ. But before we look at those, look at how he starts what brings new life. When he starts talking about new life, he, he starts with the words, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. You see, We'll talk about what happens, but this is the why it happens. Why are we born again? And you see the reason why we're born again? It has nothing to do with your effort. It has nothing to do with, with who you are, how hard you try, where you come from. It doesn't even have to do with God seeing you and noticing how miserable you are without him. What makes us born again is, again, is, is God in himself has an overpowering, overwhelming, overcoming love and it's out of just his own goodness that he saves you nothing to do with you nothing to do with me there's nothing we didn't have a hand up saying save me and we didn't have some talent that he noticed but it's just the goodness of God that it comes out of him and rescues us from where we're headed but you know the hope of that the hope of that is if it's not based in anything that we do there is nobody here Nobody here that is outside the reach of God because it's based only in him. 
not based in you. And so you may come in and secretly think church is good for everybody else, but nobody knows the stuff in my past. Nobody knows the doubts, the temptations, the lust, the failures, and I could never tell anybody. Don't even think about any of that right now, but look at the text that the salvation of God himself rushes to people, not because of who they are, but because he's good and he loves. What, what, how wonderful is he? How wonderful. That's why, but, but Paul says there's three things that happens when he makes us alive. In verse five, you see that when, when, he, when he makes us alive, he makes us alive even when we're, even when we're dead in our trespasses and sins. He, he comes and makes us alive. We were dead in sin before Christ. And God forgave us by Jesus paying the price for, for our sin. So that prison that I was talking about earlier, we're in that prison, every one of us, before God comes. And in that prison, we are in our own cell of lust and desires, and we are justly condemned by a righteous God because we have a sinful nature and we've chased down things and done things. And in that prison cell, Jesus comes And he takes our place. He takes our place, our death sentence on death row. He takes our place and he dies in our place and opens the prison door and lets us go free. Jesus makes us alive even when we're dead. But not just makes us alive. Because in the next verse, Paul says, not only does he makes us alive, but he also raises us up, raises us up with Christ. He raises us up to sit with with the Lord himself in heavenly places. So, so Jesus comes and he, he is perfectly righteous. He has perfect fellowship with the Father. He's done nothing wrong. And when Jesus sets us free, he gives us his record of perfect righteousness. And so far from just opening the prison door to your life and saying, here you go, here's another shot, try it again and see if you get it. The Lord doesn't do that. The Lord takes our place, throws open the prison doors, and takes his righteousness and puts it on us and says, now you don't have a past. You are completely restored to the Father. You're not just on even ground, but now God delights in you so much that he's brought you up right now so that you can be with him in fellowship. And so the doors are open. Righteousness is put on you. The Holy Spirit comes to live in you and empower you and lead you, and he's given you a new heart and a new life. Jesus raises us up and puts us in heavenly places with Christ. And look at the next thing he says, the last thing he says, that there's a reason why he makes us alive and why he raises us up. He says in verse seven, the the reason that he does this is so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ. Now, I love this part for a couple of reasons. Those words, so that, so that, here's the first reason. It, this shows the wondrous grace and kindness of God. That he says, when Paul's writing this, he says that he, he's going to, God's going to show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness in the coming ages, so for eternity. The first reason this is so rich is what it's saying is that our lives will be a display of the glory and the love and the forgiveness of God for all eternity, when I was studying this, I had in my mind, you know the guys that, that uh, wave football flags when people make a touchdown? Do football teams score in Oklahoma? Do they? No, I'm teasing. Uh, when they, when, you know when they score and that one guy's down there waving the flag in the end zone? Like, that's what our lives will be for eternity. For eternity, our lives will, will declare the goodness of God. They'll declare the times that nobody knew that we would have given up, but the Holy Spirit came and strengthened us. The, 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 the hundreds of times nobody knew about that we were questioning, but the Spirit strengthened us. And so for eternity, it will declare the immeasurable richness of the grace and the kindness of God. That's the first reason. But the second reason that I love it is how tightly it's worded. You know, he says, look, you're, you, you are made alive, and since you've been made alive, you have now been raised up, and since you've been raised up, the reason is, is so that for eternity, something's going to happen with you. And Paul is using here resurrection language. He's, he's comparing it, he's bringing in the resurrection of Jesus to tell you that if you have been saved, nothing will stop 
the eternal plan God has for you, that for eternity you'll be with the Lord. The reason this is important is he's talking about Christ's resurrection. And when, when Christ resurrected, everything changed. It, it changed everything. When Christ was raised from the dead, it was the beginning, the dawn of a new day of new creation. When Jesus breaks out of the grave, the first light comes into the cold, dark world and pierces, and he is the new creation. The Bible says that he, when he was resurrected, now death has no more dominion over him. And he, he is the first fruits of many who believe. So what Paul is saying is that the resurrection of Christ, this new creation, it kicked off the dawning of a new day that's coming, but it didn't stop there. Everybody that's born again has been brought into this new creation and the promise is that God will come back and make all things new. So if you are born again, you are part of a day that's coming, the day that will never end, when there's no more sin or sickness or disease, nothing else, when Christ is all in all and reigns and if you believe, you're part of that and nothing can change that. That's important to remember that you're, you're new creation because those of us facing discouragement, you can look at things that are coming and think, well, is this changing? Is, this, is anything shaking what the Lord has done in me? But the promise is if the Lord has started this, he's going to stop it. I was, the, the Lord really did heal me of COVID and I'm thankful for that. But you know, if COVID would have taken me, it still wouldn't stop what's coming for me. That one day when Christ returns and the, and the sun is fully, the, the Lord is fully reigning, king and kings and lord of lords, everybody that's in him will be part of the new creation. Nothing can stop that. Not COVID, not cancer, not brokenness, not even your own struggle with sin. If you are his, the reason is so that for eternity you will be part of his plan. Whatever you're facing today, hold, you, we hold on to that. Paul said it better than I ever could in Romans 8. He said, who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know what Paul is saying is if he has begun it in you, nothing you are facing will stop him from performing what he set out to do. For eternity you'll be his. And, and then the last point, the third point Paul makes is we were dead and in Christ God makes us alive. And lastly he says, if that's true then, then these formerly dead, in prison people that are now set free will want to do good works. Their lives will just be the kind of lives that do good works to the glory of God. In verses eight through 10, he shows this. For by grace you have been saved through faith, he says. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. So in verse eight, we'll just look at these three verses to end here. In verse eight, he says, um, look, you've been saved by grace through faith. It's not your own doing. It's the gift of God. When, when we know that God saved us based on his own grace and his own love, that our acceptance and God's love for us is not found in works. It's found in the grace and the love of God. It, it allows us to do good works. Here's why. If, if your acceptance to God and your salvation to God is based on what you do, you will we'll constantly live a life that's either prideful or devastated all the time. Because when we do everything like we should, all the works line up, we'll be proud. We did it. We did it, and then when we fail and we mess up, we'll be devastated because it's all our acceptance and our salvation is, is relying on us. But when it's relying on grace, when you, me when you mess up, you're helped. You fall back on grace. And when you succeed, you're humbled because you remember if, it, if this is all because of the Lord. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the Lord. So it, it gives us stable lives where we live in grace. 
The second thing it does is he says, it's not of works so that no one can boast. Knowing that we are saved by, by the grace of God allows us to do works without boasting. And if we don't have this, then um, when we do good works, we have to tell everybody about it. We have to tell because our salvation is dependent on us, so we have to either brag on it or we hope that people notice it. But when, we're, when our salvation is based on Christ, we don't have to tell anybody. And it, it, in, the, in a church fellowship, it keeps the fellowship healthy because if we have, if all of us think that our salvation is based on us, then we're always comparing to one another. And I'll go out to eat with you and I'll leave and be depressed because I think I wish I was that kind of person. I'll never be that kind of person. I'm just discouraged. Or I'll, I'll leave and, and be prideful because I think, well, I do more than them. I give more than them. But knowing, knowing that it's grace removes boasting from the church. We all are here because of the, of the blood of Christ. We're all here because of the grace of God. Then the last thing he says, he says, um, when you realize there in verse 10 that you're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do the works that he's prepared before him, you end up walking in them. End up walking in them in verse 10. It's um, interesting because this is how the chapter started. You remember in verse two, he said, you used to walk in all the wrong things, but now as new creation, you end up walking in good works. And, and um, that, that God has prepared. It becomes, he's saying, more of a way of life. It, it's just something that comes out of you now. And, and here's how it works. How do we forgive others? How do we give to people? How do we pray for people? How do we do all these things? Well, when we have a, a group of people, when we have seen the grace of God and we've seen that God has, has rescued us from the dead, and he made us alive, and he raised us up with Christ and promised us eternity, our hearts say, Lord, whatever you want, whatever you wanna do, I, I want to do it. See, I'm walking in good work. So when I have somebody in my life that I need to forgive, and I think about, look, he forgave me, and it was nothing to do with me. I didn't repent sincerely enough. I didn't pay for it enough. It was just the grace of God. Well, now I can forgive because I know I was forgiven. Why would I hold forgiveness from them when I was forgiven based solely on the goodness of God or, or giving? When I feel the Spirit prompt me to give anything, well, and, and my natural inclination is to hold on, but then I reflect on, wait, he didn't even... He didn't even hold on to his own life. He laid it down, he gave. Well, see, then my heart is turned and now I give whatever you want me to give, Lord. I'll give whatever you want me to give. The more that you see Christ, the grace of God, the more it allows you to walk in good works. It actually becomes now a way of life because you're being changed by seeing more and more of Jesus. You're being changed because you see what he did for you and in turn, when you see the beauty of Christ, it changes and now we relate to one another differently the more we see him but it's uh it's getting close to christmas right does hobby lobby have their stuff out i think so um do you remember the christmas movie about scrooge a christmas carol um here's scrooge and he's he's mean and he's greedy and he hated christmas and uh just an awful guy well, what changed him what changed scrooge Remember, he wouldn't give. He was really hateful to everybody. He wouldn't forgive people. Uh, he wasn't generous. He definitely wasn't of Christmas present comes and the ghost of Christmas present shows him that there's still parties happening all around and even in his meanness there's still people saying you know little prayers for him or talking good about him and he's missing out but Scrooge still doesn't change his heart maybe his heart was warmed a little but no change and then the ghost of Christmas to come the ghost of Christmas future shows up and that ghost shows him 
what's going to happen, what could happen. And he shows him an empty seat at Tiny Tim's table. Remember, he's not there anymore. And he, he shows him like kids that are, that are starving because nobody was generous and they're dying. Um, you know, uh, uh, but even that doesn't change Scrooge. It doesn't change him. All those things, they get a reaction, but there's no deep change. But then the ghost of Christmas future, future takes him and shows him a corpse with a sheet over it. This is a kid's movie, right? It shows him this corpse with a sheet over it. He says, is that me? And then he's transported to a gravestone and he wipes the dirt off and it, he sees that. Here lies Ebenezer Scrooge. And, and he says, is this, is this me? Is this what's happened or what's going to happen or can it be changed? And he's transported back. And when Ebenezer gets back, he's completely different because he realizes I have a second chance. I, I, that's what I deserve. That's where I should have been. But now I have a second chance. And when grace grabs all of him, he's starting to buy turkeys. He's going to parties. He's generous. He's letting the place get warmed up and using more coal because he sees what he should have been and grace changes his heart. And it's the same for us. You can look at all kinds of things, figure out your story in the past, but it may not change you. You can look around at things going on and really try, and it may help your heart, but it may not change you. The thing that truly changes us is when the Holy Spirit comes and makes us alive and we look back and say, that's where I should have been. I should have been for eternity, dead in trespasses and sin, but the grace of God came and rescued me and changed me and gave me new life, not based on anything I did, not based on anything that you did this morning. If you believe, the grace of God can rush in and make you a new creation completely. And when grace grips our heart, it changes us so that we walk in good works. If I've been forgiven, if I've been changed, where can I love? Who can I forgive? I did more against him than anybody could do against me, so I walked in those good works. If you're here this morning and you haven't been made into a new creation, the Bible says that if you believe in him, if you believe in him and, and put your faith on him, see him and ask the Holy Spirit to, to create a new heart in you, that you could be part of that new creation that's coming. All because of Christ. Nothing to do with you, all because of Christ. I think um, in this day and age where our society, our world is thirsting for identity, the, the question is for you this morning, who are you? What defines you? What is your identity? And the world will tell you a thousand things, but for the believer, if you, if you have been born again, that means you've been created again, your new creation in Christ. And God is your father. You're now a part of a new creation that's coming that can never be changed. It's coming and it's on its way. Sin has lost its hold on you forever. Death has lost its victory in you. It has no place in you because you've been created in Christ. It is, there is nothing better than that. And now we live it out because we know he's given us grace. Would you pray with me? Oh, Father, for any person here this morning that, that doesn't know you, Holy Spirit, I just ask you to do what only you can and bring new life. Even right now where that person is sitting, don't let them think they have to do anything but really believe in you and, and do that, Lord. Bring new life. We ask him for any believer that's discouraged, that's facing something, would you just remind them that they've been made alive and raised up so that uh, for eternity they'll be part of the new creation that's coming and help us to walk that out this week only on your grace. Definitely not because of what we've done. We'll give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pat.